Good news, good news, always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. No matter what else is happening in the world, always good news, good news, there is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. What's your thought about marriage? You know, there have been a lot of anecdotes about, about marriage. The late Minnie Pearl said marriage was like uh, taking a bath in a tub of hot water. After a while, it ain't so hot. Well, we'd like to think that that was only a joke, but tragically, in many cases, marriages do cool with time. Well, today in our commentary segment, we're going to talk about a recent survey that talks about how bad marriages can actually adversely affect one's physical health. You will not want to miss that. That's coming up in our commentary segment a little bit later on. But let me tell you what else is coming your way on this edition of Good News Today. A great challenges segment with uh, Stephen Hall as he talks about one of the acts of worship, the Lord's Supper. And uh, you will not want to miss this. And then a little bit later on, it is Leroy Dedman with Leaving a Legacy as um, he talks about making errors and he cites an example of a Major League Baseball player years ago who made four errors in one inning. But things got better for him later in that game. And then you'll see how Leroy applies that so beautifully to our lives spiritually. You will not want to miss that. Well, that's what's coming your way, and we're glad you've come our way. Of course, we begin, as always, with our devotional time, and that consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and then a brief study of our scripture. And today our scripture comes from the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So we'll have, I hope you have your Bibles open that you'll turn with us to Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, which begins, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will.
we're back for the study portion of our devotional time, looking today at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and the first verse begins with the word therefore, and as you've heard to say, when we see therefore, we look to see what it's there for. In other words, it tends to take us back to gain the context a little more fully. And of course, the therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Well, but you know, go back a couple of verses with me to Hebrews 1, 13 and 14, where the writer declares, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they, angels that is, not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Now we're back to therefore, we must give the more earnest heed. What, uh, what the writer has been discussing in the previous verses is that Christ is above or better than the angels. Keep in mind that we've mentioned this when we've looked at passages from Hebrews in the past on the program, that the key word in Hebrews is better, and the contrast is between the old covenant, the law of Moses, and the new and better covenant, the law of Christ, and that Christ is superior, superior to Moses, superior, his law is superior to the old law. Uh, he is superior to the angels. That's the immediate context in which we find the verses we're looking at now. So, with that uh, little bit of background, we go to verse 1, therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. We are under that new and better covenant. If we're Christians today, we are blessed to be uh, away from that old law that could not take away sins, absolutely, but that was to point us to a new and better law, to point, uh, to point those who were under that law to Christ. And we must give the more earnest heed to that new and better covenant. And here's the, the, the rationale in verse 2 that the writer by inspiration gives us. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. Here he's writing about the old law that was ministered through uh, angels. Angels had a part in the giving of that law. We're not given details about that, but uh, that is referenced in passages like Galatians 3.19, for example. Paul uh, mentions that at that uh, in that passage. So the angels were involved in the ministering, the giving of the old law, the law of Moses. And the reminder in verse 2 is that if that word proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, think about Nadab and Abihu, the sons of the high priest. Think about Achan and his household uh, that were uh, destroyed. Think about all those Old Testament, uh, Old Testament examples that you have there. And the writer is saying, if those transgressions under that former covenant receive that kind of just reward, here's his point in verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? In other words, the salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus and under the new covenant far exceeds anything and everything that was available to those who lived and died under that old covenant. Why is this such a great salvation now? Why, why would the writer call it so great a salvation? Well, because, it, because of the purchase price. Uh, the purchase price for this salvation that is available to us was the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, not with uh, silver and gold or, or things of that nature, as Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, but with the precious blood of, a, of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. And so this is so great a, a salvation because of the purchase price and because of the prince of peace who purchased this salvation with his blood. And, of course, it is so great a salvation because of the result of this salvation. As we mentioned earlier, absolute forgiveness of sins was not available under the Old Covenant, but it is available to all those under the New Covenant. Oh yes, no wonder the writer refers to this as so great a salvation. And if every transgression under that Old Covenant was punished, as those examples we cited reveal to us, then what's going to happen if we escape the greatest salvation that has ever been or ever shall be offered to mankind. That's the point that he is making. And he goes on to elaborate in verse 3, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord 
in his ministry, of course, uh, as he came, and was confirmed to us uh, by those who heard him, uh, those who heard him and who were eyewitnesses of his majesty, etc. cetera. Uh, and then, speaking of witnessing, um, he says in verse 4, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Now, here in verse 4, we have another passage that makes it abundantly clear that the signs and wonders, the various miracles, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all of these phrases, all of these words refer to the miraculous. And the miraculous was there for a temporary period of time for a specific purpose. What was that purpose? To confirm the message to confirm first of all that Jesus is the Christ. When Jesus came to earth he of course did miracles, uh, amazing things of all kinds of, uh, of uh, miraculous uh, things, raising the dead, etc., restoring uh, the, the deaf to be able to hear, the blind to see, etc. All of these uh, bore witness to the fact that he is the Christ. They were undeniable miracles. And, of course, then when he ascended after his resurrection, he promised and then fulfilled that promise to his apostles that they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit that would enable them to not only speak in languages they had never learned, as they did on Pentecost when the gospel was first preached, but to also lay hands on others to impart miraculous abilities and, of course, to do those miraculous things themselves. But when the last person died upon whom an apostle had laid hands to impart those miraculous gifts, those miraculous gifts ceased. Should we be concerned about that? No, because that's what God intended all along. He never intended for the miraculous to continue, but just to the point at which this written and completed Word of God was confirmed, completely confirmed. And so the witness has been born, and the things that are written now in this, the final revelation of God to man, the New Testament, these are the things that um, furnish us completely unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And John reminds us in John 20, 30 and 31, many other signs truly Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that in order that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing you might have life in his name. They are written that you might believe. When you read 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13, a passage we've uh, mentioned before, when you read 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13, you see that the miraculous gifts were to last until that which is perfect, complete or whole, had come. That which is complete or perfect or whole has come. It is the written Word of God in its final and complete form. Therefore, the miracles are written to produce faith. And this book proves itself to be inspired of God. Therefore, when we read of the miracles, we have the same faith produced in us, if we are of honest and good hearts, that those people who saw the miracles had produced in them. We don't need to see them performed any longer. So God bore witness with signs and wonders, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will, but according to his will, those miraculous signs were to cease when the written word of God was made complete and whole. Well, that's all the time we have for our devotional time. It is time now for another Challenges segment. As we mentioned earlier, Stephen Hall talks about one very important act of worship, the Lord's Supper. Here's Stephen. The great privilege of worship is given to Christians, those who live faithfully, and those, of course, who walk in the light are privileged to worship our Lord. But notice that worship is not for the self-willed or the self-desirous or the proud man. Worship is not to be entered into with carelessness, but rather with a prepared mind. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. And if one takes away from God's Word, there will be serious consequences. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. 
The Bible says, You shall not add to the word which I'm commanding you, nor take away from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. In the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 18, the Bible records that I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. Well, consider today the act of worship that we call the Lord's Supper. Notice the richness and the importance of the Lord's Supper. It's conveyed by the various names that are given in the Bible. For example, the names imply the various purposes of partaking of the Lord's Supper. For example, in Acts 2 verse 42, we read of it as the breaking of bread. We also see that the word Eucharist is used from the Greek word meaning to give thanks, Matthew 26, 26 and 27. So this means that we are thankful, that we are breaking the bread with a heart that is thankful. And we're thankful for the forgiveness of sins, but this does not mean that the Lord's Supper gives or provides forgiveness for our sins. Now, the, does the Lord's Supper hold a special meaning in your heart today? Well, let's just take note of a couple of memorials, for the Lord's Supper is a memorial. Take note, first off, of the Lincoln Memorial. It has a retaining wall of 14 feet in height. It has a width of 257 feet. It's over 79 feet tall. It's large. It's visible from miles away. What about the World War II Memorial? It had 5 million visitors in 2015. 4.86 million visitors in 2016, and 4.88 million visitors in 2017. Well, let's think about this for a moment. How many do you think are as interested in the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Memorial, even though it's not as large as the Lincoln Memorial, even though it isn't attended by as many people, perhaps, as the World War II Memorial? You see, the Lord's Supper is the greatest memorial of all. It was the Apostle Paul who wrote, For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. You see, during the Lord's Supper, we commemorate the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And notice that His death made the new covenant possible. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16. The writer says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. We proclaim our faith in the efficacy of the Lord's death. We're thankful for that. And we proclaim our faith in that the Lord's death was indeed for our sins. And our faith is in that He is going to return. And therefore, we look backward and we look forward. Well, the Lord's Supper must be observed with great reverence, self-examination. It must be done publicly with the brethren, and it must be done weekly. You see, our spiritual lives are dependent upon the value and the benefits of the Lord's death on the cross. And so a weekly observance of the memorial then helps us to live appreciatively and accordingly. May we never lose sight of the significance of the Lord's Supper. Our thanks to Stephen Hall for his excellent segment on the Lord's Supper coming up. It is Leroy Dedman's Leaving a Legacy. Right after we take a brief, very important information break. We'll be right back. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee 37327. That's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free 
at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our viewers is always good news to us. We hope you'll take advantage of that contact information. We also want to remind you about our app that you can download free, the Good News Today app. Just go to your appropriate uh, app store, look for Good News Today. You'll see the yellow logo with Good News Today there. Download it and you can watch the entire program, programs that are archived, and also uh, individual segments are available. So if you want to see a segment like Leroy Dedman's segment or Stephen Hall or the others that are featured on Good News Today, you can do that. Spend three or four minutes with the segment if that's all the time you have. So we hope you will take advantage of that. Also visit our website at gnttv.org. Right now, here's Leroy Dedman. Have you ever done something you thought was smart only later to realize how dumb it was? I read recently where a man locked his keys in the car and after several minutes of frustration he called a locksmith. Locksmith used a special tool to unlock the door. Well, seeing how simple it worked, he managed to purchase one of the tools and with a smirkish grin he looked at his wife as he put the tool under the seat and said, we'll keep it here and if it ever happens again I won't have to call a locksmith. Well, I'm quite certain all of us can say we have done some things that might fall into the category of dumb. It's not the end of the world when we err and make mistakes. And although we don't like the word sin, we are sometimes guilty. The Bible says if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his truth is not in us. My little children, these things are right to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 1 John chapter 1, verse 10, and chapter 2, verse 1. In 1956, 1986, Bob Brindley was playing third base for the San Francisco Giants. In the fourth inning of a game against the Atlanta Braves, Brindley made an error on a routine ground play. Four batters later, he kicked away another grounder. And then while he was scrambling after the ball, he threw widely past home plate, trying to get the runner there. Two errors on the same play. A few minutes later, he muffed yet another play to become the first player in the 20th century to make four errors in one inning. Now, those of us who have made very public errors in one situation or another can easily imagine how he felt during that long walk off the field at the end of that inning. But in the bottom of the fifth, Brindley hit a home run. Then in the seventh, he hit a bases-loaded single, driving in two runs and tying the game. Then in the bottom of the ninth, Brindley came up to bat again with two outs. He ran the count to three and two and hit a massive home run into the left field seats to win the game for the Giants. Brindley's scorecard for that day came to three hits, five at-bats, two home runs, four errors, four runs allowed, four runs driven in, including the game-winning run. The Christian life is much like Bob Brindley's activities for the day. When we sin, we should never give up or lose heart, but we should repent, pick ourselves up, Forget the things that are behind and strive to do better. And when we repent, it means that we have just hit the game winner with the God's angels cheering us as we round third, headed for home.
We're back for our final segment. It's our commentary segment, and the story that comes from The Guardian online reports that a bad marriage with frequent conflicts could have a serious detrimental impact on your health. That is according to psychologists. The researchers at the universities of Nevada and Michigan monitored 373 couples to investigate whether disagreeing about multiple topics such as children, money, uh, in-laws, leisure activities, whether or not these things had negative health implications. According to Rosie uh, Shrout, who was among these researchers, she said, quote, we followed married couples over the first 16 years of marriage and compared the subjective health of wives and husbands who reported a greater number of conflict topics to those who reported fewer. And the researchers found that marital conflict negatively affected health for both husbands and wives, but there was a greater impact of conflict on men than women. Conflict in a relationship can lead to damaging responses in the body, such as inflammation, changes in appetite, and increased release of stress hormones, all of which can affect numerous aspects of health, ranging from heart function to the immune system. And um, that's what previous research had found. Well, uh, researcher Rosie uh, Shrout also said, after, saying that a bo after noting that a body of evidence suggests married people tend to live longer, healthier lives than those who are divorced, widowed, or never married, then uh, she, quote, she says, quote, they have better psychological well-being, they are less likely to develop illnesses, and they heal faster when they are sick. But Shrout did add, it's not the act of walking down the aisle or signing a marriage license that is beneficial for health. It's what spouses do for each other throughout the marriage. Well, is there a better source? Is there as good a source as to what spouses should do for each other in marriage than what we find in the Word of God? As in passages like Ephesians 5, 22 and following, and 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. You see... The marriage institution is a God-ordained institution. And when we, when we enter it and maintain it as God intended it in a Christian home where both husband and wife are in Christ following biblical teaching, it works out beautifully. Thanks for being with us. There is good news today all around the world. Good news, good news, always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today. Good news, good news, the world always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world, good news, always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.